if you guys want to say something, continue to ask questions. I'm going to be asking you lots of questions. Use the chat. That's huge. We are recording this for people in the future. And that's the easiest way to score a goal in lacrosse. Today, we'll talk about advanced offense, everybody's favorite. Starting with a good question that's that Brendan Hunt had about matchups um, related to last week in advanced defense. So I'll answer that in a second here. After that, we'll, we'll go into the stick work uh, skills analysis just to kind of like pick out some of the more intricate details because in the past we've looked at like passing, catching, shooting from a fundamentals perspective. But today we'll, uh, we'll just look at some of those finer details and even more when we get to those definitions down there. But um, first we'll, we'll take another broad stroke look at our offensive principles, which we really haven't done yet outside of talking about reverse transition going the opposite direction. Um, so after somebody shoots, um, obviously the D taking off. Then we'll walk through some offensive drills with some advanced skills, um, get into a few multiple choice questions at the end. Sound good? Yeah. Okay. Um, for starters, Brendan Hunt asked, because we were talking about switching and stuff on picks, and um, we talked about getting size on size and speed on speed where possible. And so he said, well, if we get that matchup, we get back, we get in the hole and we pick up these guys that we want, let's say on the other team. And then all of a sudden they throw a pick and, and we're forced to switch. Well, so much for the matchup. That's right. And the way that team like that, you get around that in a perfect world, you're so confident in your defense. You feel that everybody can defend everybody and you don't need a special matchup. If you're really onto a special matchup, most, most of the time, that person who's matched up, once they get it, they stay on everything. So they stay man-to-man -man with no switches on everything, which was opposite of what we talked about last week with automatic switching. You would switch out of desperation if that player just got brutally picked off and you just had to go. You just got to go. But uh, for the most part, everybody knows that the player who's got the matchup is trying to stay on it. You might see something like that with like a Curtis Dixon, like one of the best one-on-one -on -one players in the world. And like, you just want to get your best one-on-one -on -one defender on him. And you, and sometimes it's two defenders or three on their side, usually two. So the, in that case, if there is a switch, it's a switch to a guy who is also a good matchup on that person who is considered obviously a, a really big threat, but Usually we like to focus on what we're doing and not necessarily what they're doing. And if we do our team defense properly, it shouldn't matter what one individual does on the other team. That said, there are still matchups that happen. And so um, part of that, Brendan, and, and why this comes up good for actually advanced offense is, so if somebody has a matchup that's like, let's just say the top defender, Graham Hosek, is is on you. Um, as, as an offensive guy and, and you're, you're like a sniper and it's like, well, you could get the pass and try to go Graham Hossick like one-on-one -on -one or, or in the pick and roll game, or you could swing it and then get it back the next time when you have somebody else on you. And maybe that's a better time to go. And so sometimes it's just recognizing the mismatches as they develop in the flow of the offense. So you start, you get size on size, speed on speed. But as it, as it goes, you get a couple switches, you lose guys. And when that happens, that's when the offensive guys start to recognize their mismatches and exploit them. Great question. Keep the questions coming. Uh, there's lots of good that comes from those type of questions. Um, speaking of questions, I do have one quick multiple choice just to get us going here. Boom, a magic. So upon receiving a pass on offense, remember we're talking advanced offense here today, what is the first action you should take? Obviously, that's a broad statement. Be a threat. Shoot the ball. Pass the ball. Keep it hot. ISO your defender or none of the above. Lots of A. I probably should have stuck A as like C or something because – Right away, you guys know, oh, there's some C's coming in. But no, the answer is actually A. Um, 
we would want to keep it hot early in the first 10 seconds for sure. Being a threat is much less important. Let's just say it took 10 seconds to, to run it down and get our offense set into onto offense. We start moving the ball around. Usually the first 10 seconds is just about ball movement. You don't really have to be a threat as much. But generally you want to um, develop the habit of as soon as you catch it, you are a threat, which means – you either use a pick that's coming for you or you make a little one-on-one -on -one move um, and, and create some space and attract some attention and then dump the ball off. But you don't just want to catch it like a robot, turn and look, pass it like a robot and like not have any interest in, in per se going to the net. So you want everybody at least kind of acting. And once in a while, you will go to the net in the first – five or 10 seconds just to catch a team off guard. But most of the, most teams try to swing the ball, get the ball moving and then, and then attack you in the last 10 seconds of the shot clock with some serious um, threats. So anyways, uh, I just wanted to just prime things with a little discussion and, and just talk about advanced offense starting kind of with being a threat. That's what it, it and we're more so talking individual offense today. Although is this is starting to be the bridge into team offense. We, we did a little bit of team offense where we talked about getting it low, sending off ball cutters through, things of that nature. Um, but while that's all happening, everybody should still be a threat. And that's why any drill that we ever do, we get you to move your feet. And, and if it's in the offensive zone, take a look at the net before you move the ball. We'll go into the stick work uh, skills analysis. So passing, I mean, We've gone through, we know about soft hands, we know how to hold the stick, uh, we know about getting perpendicular and pointing our toes, following through the target, keeping our eyes on the target, that's nothing new, bringing our weight back, all that kind of stuff, passing kind of, you know, that's the basic mechanics there. Catching, um, you know, you show a target. We, we talked about that. Sometimes it's not always right by your ear. Uh, you need to shield people with your body sometimes to make it work. And um, for advanced players, you know, you got to mix it up a little bit, right? You got you to gotta start doing things not so predictable. Um, sometimes you get passes that are across your body. You need to know how to catch and adjust to those. Um, you know, these bad habits like twirling the stick after you catch it. Those are things that we want to try to eliminate. Here's another one. If a pass is, is sent in tight to your body, okay, um, really you have to keep your hand, one at the butt end and one up close to the head of the stick. And that's how you would catch that. And you have to almost like, if it's to the wrong other side of your body, you have to like face dodge over there to catch it uh, with your stick, bring it across your face. But um, those are just a couple little things, you know, not necessarily super advanced, but, you know, things to consider. But here we are. Let's just talk a little bit about basic principles that speak to, I would say, advanced offense. We went over this transitioning to D, okay? We want to make 90-degree changes, get off hard, uh, know what to do in the last five seconds, which is if there's no shot there, it's actually dump it in the corner and get off. Don't take a stupid shot from 30 meters out and give them a transition the other way. Just, okay, we'll get them the next time. Get rid of it. Get everybody off the floor. That means they get no fast break. Um, we talked about our changes, but um, today we're going to talk a little bit in general about like knowing where to be. Okay. Seeing the ball, knowing, like looking at your D guys and, and seeing what they're positioning and body language is telling you knowing some different situations we'll do that a little bit more in team offense we already talked about multiple resets and not wanting to shoot it right away if we get it but um generally on offense here's some of the principles with the ball we want to get it low we want to keep it hot which means keep it moving and not stuck in somebody's stick and we also want to use b so what is B? We'll go over what B is, but that means passing it through the point position. So either the passer runs the ball to the point, which is like top center relative to the net, or the receiver runs there to receive the pass 
and we have a nice short pass across the top each time. Um, that goes with our ABCs of offense. So always be cycling is what that stands for. That's Eddie Como, Como from Georgia. That was his mantra, and I've kind of uh, adopted it here for us. Um, for movement, so we don't want to park in, in any space. We don't want to like, oh, I'm a crease guy, so I'm going to just hang out by the crease. I'm a shooter. I'm just going to run to the shooter and never cut through the middle. Uh, yada, yada, yada. We want to be uh, cycling through with speed. We want to be physical and bumping and setting picks and seals. So um, those, are, those are some of the things that will, will come to light here as well today. Um, and, and then so like staying spread and spacing, how to overload certain areas and, um, and how to have kind of floor balance, high, low, through the middle which we talked about yesterday on the three man side. So how do we do that? So uh, those are our principles. Um, I wanted to go over a few definitions with you here. What is good offense? So when I think about uh, a player who's good on offense, I think good hands, I think scoring touch, they can finish in tight, they're a goal scorer, they're a passer, they're a shooter, they're accurate. They're patient. They let the game come to them. They don't force it. Okay? So scoring touch is the uncanny ability to score goals. Um, it's the opposite of what I would call an egg and spooner, which is somebody with no hands who just runs around looking like they're trying to stop an egg from breaking. No, no, they don't have any, any hands, really, um, which is okay. Not everybody does. I, I don't, per se, if you look relatively speaking at the pro level. But um, – Anyways, it could also refer to being able to catch uh, passes in tight spaces. Like John Tavares used to be the best at that. You'd think you'd have him covered. And like as the ball's released from the guy's stick, he's like somehow creating separation with one arm, catching with the other, and then turning it into some shot, screenshot is just, you know, it's a nightmare. But, um, you know, it, it could also mean like you could have good hands on loose balls. You're just really – smooth you don't miss the ball very often but um generally safely handling the ball somebody i trust with the ball in their stick is somebody who i would say has good hands and a, really a defining feature too is the accuracy with which they do things like how often can they put the pass on the money the shot on the money um and how 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 consistently do they pick up the loose ball do they catch the ball when it's passed to them like do they take care of the ball do they turn it over i would say if somebody who has good hands doesn't turn the ball over very often. Um, and uh, yeah, it's generally, it's a broad stroke that you do pretty much everything kind of well. Um, a pure, pure goal scorers are very patient. They know what's a good shot. What's not. They're great at disguising their shot, um, throwing misdirection on their shots. Okay. Like cripplers, those are called, or you're looking somewhere, no look. You, you look left with your eyes, but you shoot right. All those little things are things that people who have, you know, good, that are good goal scorers and finishers, for instance, they've figured out. That's just generally speaking, but everybody's different. So there's, you know, there's people that specialize at the crease, at the shooter, at the point position. You've got what I would can call like slashers or like, um, you know, people in basketball be somebody who takes it to the rack, you know, good one on one people. But then you also have like power forwards who create space for people, set picks, and do things differently. But um, generally, so a crease specialist, somebody who specializes at the crease, um, which is that imaginary area about five meters away from the net down low, um, they obviously should have a good touch and tight. Right. So sometimes they're not the greatest outside of shooters, but if they get the ball in tight, they're really good with fakes and they can, they can tuck it in real nice. Um, often they're larger. They don't have to be. Okay. But if you're a big body and you go from low to high on an inside out up pick, you're going to create a lot of space for the shooters. So the crease players are often expected to do a lot of the dirty work in the middle, digging for loose balls in the corners um and but they don't necessarily have to be big and if they're not big they have what they may or lack in size they need to make up for with stick skills hard work having a good quick stick is another one 
Okay. Um, you know, in the NLL, you don't necessarily see uh, big guys all the time at the crease. You know, on our team, we got Clark Peterson down there sometimes, and he's just got a deadly quick stick. And it's, it's a huge threat that the other teams have to be aware of. And, and again, these guys, you know, some of them, that's their wheelhouse. But it doesn't mean they park there. They, when they get there and they have the ball, they seize the opportunity. When they're in the area, if they're good with a quick stick, they're going to be flashing their stick, trying to, trying to open a lane for a potential quick stick. That's part of their game. And other guys are looking for them when they're in that area. Um, other guys are more dominant in the shooter spot. And that's kind of up um, 45 degrees off the post, about 10 meters on the cusp of the prime scoring area, which we've talked so much about. And good shooters um, have obviously – great shooting ability, but also passing ability being up high. They're setting up, you know, they're making a lot of passes on plays and stuff. They're seeing a lot of the floor. Um, often they have quick feet. It's not, it's not necessary. The best ones these days do, and they're able to kind of like streak up and down and, and create some uh, two on ones off of picks using their quick footwork. Uh, but sometimes it's just guy, a guy with a bomb of a shot up there. And um, not necessarily great at beating one guys one on one. It helps, but it's not necessarily mandatory. A good, quick catch and shoot is helpful, um, and knowing when to shoot. Good shot selection. I mean, the crease guys, it's pretty automatic for them. If they're getting, if you're at around the crease and you're getting the the pass and you catch it, you you know you're pretty much shooting, and you're you're in tight already. But shooters have to make some more people at the shooter position have to make better decisions like a shot with 15 seconds left on the clock from way out there. Um, isn't necessary. It's okay with five seconds sh left on the clock, but with, in other, you got to know not to shoot that if it's on the 45 degree angle and try to develop something better. So um, there's uh, there's more responsibility up there for guarding reverse transition or breakaways and fast breaks to the other team when you're notoriously a shooter and you're taking a lot of shots for your team. So that's where, like, in the old days, you had bigger, slower guys with hard shots, but they can't, they can't catch the reverse transition. They give up too many breakaways, and they're a liability in that case. So um, they're kind of fading away. Everybody's got to be in shape. Um, and, yeah, on the, on the power play, um, again – you want guys with your strongest shots kind of in those positions. So that's a specialist at the shooter. And then at the point, it's very similar. Okay. Again, it's that top center position. I could show you a diagram if you want, let me know. Um, but usually that's your best passer. You're, you, you're, you're, you're often you're passing the ball when you're in this area. I mean, if you're wide open, of course you're shooting as well. But again, this is kind of our, our cycling area where we move the ball through the point. It's not necessarily a spot where people stay for too long. So out of all the, the other two positions I told you and now the point position, this one, if you're going to park somewhere, this is the worst place to park. You usually pass, get right through, and get on with it. But um, on the power play, it's a little bit different. And again, this is usually – your best playmaker, they, they run your power play, they're your quarterback, they're great feeders. But sometimes, too, if, if they're not respecting that person's shot and they're cheating too much to the shooters, you can stick your, strong, your guy with the strongest shot there and they can become um, – they can just rip a wide-open shot from top center, which is a great uh, place to shoot from. So, as you can see, there's different roles for different people. Okay, and you got to you got to know your role and respect the boundaries of your role and do your role and, you know, um, treat it as if it's, you know, even if it's not the person who's shooting the game winning shot all the time, you got to take pride in it as like be an all star at your role is kind of what we say. I know my role as a defender. Okay, I'm a loose ball, um, tough, gritty defender. And that's, that's the game I play. And I've learned it over the years. Guess what? In junior A, I was a 50-point getter on the Orangeville Northman. And by the time I hit pro, um, I did play one or two games, actually, my first year on offense. But um, in senior and everything else, is it's all D now. And most D guys are washed up O guys from junior. 
So don't think, A, that you don't need to learn how to play D. But also, the big problem for people is when they're used to having their ball, the ball in their sticks their whole career. And for those of you that eventually leave New Brunswick and go play in Orangeville and other places, because you will, um, you might go from having the ball in your stick all the time to being the fourth righty or the fifth lefty to, you know, in terms of points or whatever. And so your role is going to change. You need to, you need to learn soon how to play off ball, how to get good at being at picking and how, at being a good feeder and knowing how to um, facilitate an offense and keep the ball moving and don't let the ball get caught up in your stick when you're supposed to be um, so, uh, just a spoke in the wheel, keeping things moving when it's, you know, you've got all stars ahead of you who are proven veterans and, and that's their role in certain cases to be taking these shots. And when you take it, it kind of takes away from the team. I don't want to, if the shots there, you're always taking it, but if it's borderline and you're a role player, you're keeping it moving. So, um, Again, there's roles for offensive and defensive guys, but you know we want to we want to maximize. In the end, you look at what you have. Okay, in the NLL, we have we play offense, defense. We got our best offensive guys on offense only. You look at those offensive guys, and you're trying to match the best skill sets and put them all together. You don't, you're not necessarily taking all the best uh, goal scorers and people for assists. You need people who are going to take out the trash. You need the garbage man in the middle, setting the picks and doing the dirty work and getting the loose balls. And you need the water bugs getting, keeping their feet moving and, and uh, clearing space for people. And so um, you got to, as a coach, as a general manager, you want to bring together a balance of skill sets on offense and defense. You don't want just 10 big brutes on defense who have no agility, no speed, can't, can't get the loose balls as well you need a balance of both um and so the same holds true for offense after you have you know understood what your role is um you need to know basically how to get out of people's way or create space for people who um are going to have the ball in their stick more than you offensively okay i'm i'm and i'm and i as a coach i tell you what i expect out of you I say, hey, I want you starting low because you're big. And, you, and then once we hit the corner with the ball and get it low, then we'll have you coming up setting picks. And that's how we're going to start our offense. And so in doing that, you need, to, you need to understand the floor. Okay, You need to know where you need to start on the floor. So you need to know the crease positions, where they are, the shooter position and everything. And if somebody is carrying the ball towards you, that usually means you need to get out of the way. Otherwise, set a pick. But um, they should have a, the player beside you, if they have the ball, should have a chance to beat their check at all times. They don't need you sitting in the middle, clogging it up. So even if they beat their check, it's not going to help because there's going to be another defending there, defender there. They need you to keep moving, uh, cycle through, set a pick, set a seal. and. Um, essentially be aware of how to create space. All right. So there's lateral spacing, which is from half the half board or the mid board to the middle to the half board. So East West spacing. And then there's North South spacing as well. There's a time to add more people into one space overloading space, but um, that's usually on set plays within the offense. But the, the person beside the ball carrier needs to, like everybody else needs to keep their players engaged. They need to, if, just if you don't have the ball, you shouldn't just be standing there being like, here, I'm open, pass to me. Okay, you need to like keep the person beside you engaged. Flash your stick, call for the ball, run high to low, um, do a little juke move or whatever. And that way they, they have to occupy themselves with you and then they therefore can't help anymore. Um, cutters. So we need to be sending them through all the time, off ball and on ball. If we're not cutting, we're not going to have success. 
And there's certain players like who just like to hang out at the shooter position and never cut through. If we do that, we end up with what we call a stagnant offense. And really, you just end up bombing it over screens if you're lucky. And hopefully something trickles in from the outside. But you got to get to the middle to win. And that's, that means having a lot of times to cut through the middle, knowing you're about to get cross-checked and everything else. Um, so I want to just raise that point. One-on-one. -on -one. So obviously advanced offense, and we've, we've talked a fair bit about one-on-one, -on -one, and I have stressed um, mostly juking, face dodging, and roll dodging. Well, there is toe drags, which is essentially a face dodge taking one hand off the stick. It's a little bit um, riskier in that sense. So is swimming. You take one hand off the stick, pull the ball over his head. Um, a bull rush is another thing. And we talked about posting up last week, and I'll show you. A lot of opportunities are created just off of somebody going one-on-one, -on -one, attracting help, and then dumping to the person who slid to them, like slid from their teammate. So that's that whole follow the slide concept, draw and dump. And so it's when you have a playmaker, okay, which I, I wanted to bring up what, a play, what I would call a playmaker is somebody who attracts a lot of attention. And they in themselves are an offense. Right? It's not an offense you'd want to go to every time because everybody will know that it's coming. But when it's clutch, you want to go to the timely playmakers to, to get you a goal. Put them on your back. And, and, you know, these are the type of players that are backbreakers who can carry two guys on their back to the net and score. And that's not everybody. You're lucky to have one per team. For the most part, you want to buy into the team offense of getting it low, sending off-ball cutters through. If the off-ball cutter is not open, they set an off-ball pick. A couple options off the pick. If that's not there, you can set an on-ball pick or seal, and, and you just keep it flowing from there, passing to anybody who's open. But then there's other times where you want to do like an ISO for your best playmaker. Um, or pick and rolls we've talked about as well. As, as things you could do differently from one-on-one -on -one stuff because you want to have like a balanced attack. But playmakers are great one-on-one. -on -one. And Curtis Dixon, again, comes to mind. These are the guys like the Kobe Bryants, the, you know, Michael Jordans or the Steph Currys that, you know, they're, they just get it done time and time again. They've proven it. They want the ball in their stick with the game on the line. I don't. I want to be on defense with the, my, with the game on the line. But – I don't want the final shot with the game on the line. And that's just, that's just where I'm at career wise. And the sooner you accept your role, I'm not at your guys' age, you can still grow. And by all means go out there and become the playmaker and get that good. I didn't start playing till I was 15. So I, I I'll never have that little touch that those guys have, but um, you know, that's where you spend the hours and you become that and they get paid the big bucks and that's what it is. And, but you know, they do things differently. They, they have disguise and deception. And so here, like with a no-looker, for instance, that could be a shot or a pass. And, and, and we practice this stuff too. But, you know, defenders, again, are trained to keep their stick up and in the passing lane. So eventually you need to do different things or you're just going to hit their stick. So you need to look right and pass left or throw a BTB pass instead of a straight pass. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's the little things. Those are that's deception. I'll click on disguise here real quick. Holding the ball behind you when you shoot, throwing fakes. Um, these are all forms of disguise, deception, or decoy, unpredictability. And once you have the fundamentals down, then you can start adding faking to things. A fake won't work on somebody who doesn't know any better. A fake works on somebody who's expecting something. So over time, goalies expect just a basic shot. So when you pump a fake and then shoot, you're doing something different out of the norm. Um, and so obviously we didn't get into a lot of faking, but misdirection even, sometimes head movements, body movements, um, stick movements, um, circling it behind your head. Um, throws the goalie off. And so 
There's different fakes you can do. Okay, I call them series of fakes. We talked a little bit about faking short side going far side. Okay, here is fake short, fake far, go short, fake far side, go fake short side, go back to the far side. Those are some classics there. But some other ones that, that people will do is cut across the goalie throwing high fakes and then throw it inside their foot on the short side. Dip and dunk is when you fake down low and then come back high over top of the goalie, which is kind of unique to lacrosse. You don't really get that in hockey. Um, so those are all little things that, um, that are helpful and in deception and, and, and scoring goals. Okay. Um, the quick stick we talked about, um, dump passes. So this, we talked about flip passes a little bit. Here's a little picture here. Me looking like an idiot doing a flip pass, but you bring it across your body and flip it. You do that a lot off of pick and rolls, right? A little flip pass. Um, otherwise known as a dump pass. It doesn't have to be that little underhand. It could just be an overhand, but you take some off it. It's like 50%. Take a little mustard off it. We call it a touch pass or a shovel pass, some people will call that. But when you learn to do dump passes from different angles, you're able to flip the ball into areas, um, into tight areas. And that's a unique thing to box lacrosse. You don't get that as much in field lacrosse. They, they see it as too high risk. But this is actually how we beat them at their own game in field lacrosse at the 2014 Worlds in Denver when Kevin Crowley had five goals in tight off of dump passes. So um, it's a great skill to have, and it's uh, something that I'll discuss a little bit more here in a second. But uh, let me just check my definitions. I think that's pretty much it. Like, I could talk about behind-the-back passes. Cripplers are when you look like you're going to go far side, and then the last second you twist it back to the sh short side. So it's kind of like we, some people call it a J shot, but as you follow through, you kind of – draw a little half circle with your hand cheeky little things that you can do for advanced offense um here now okay is kind of where we finished off drill wise and you guys were doing things like catching and shooting with a quick release two drills before that you had to catch a lead pass running from low to high and then catching the ball in stride and turning your momentum this way and getting a shot off. So only reason I'm bringing that up is because it's we're catching balls while we're moving, throwing to an area where they're going, not where they are with lead passes. Okay, all that is going to be important when we start doing some of these more complex things and having to quickly catch and shoot the ball. Okay, so I think this next one is okay. So I catch a swing pass, and as soon as I catch it, I'm turning it into a face dodge right away. So I'm not quick sticking it. I'm, maybe it was a bad pass, so I wasn't able to quick stick it for a quick shot if I could. So I face dodge, I roll underneath, and I do that, but the defender cuts me off at 45 degrees. So now I curl out and, oh, what do you know? There's an off-ball cutter doing his job. Hit him with the pass for a shot. That's just, that's just a variation of catching and, and this time not shooting but attacking. Curling out because it's not there, having the discipline to do that. Here is, is taking more of a run, so it's going to be a lot more harder of a pass where you run from the mid boards, both of you, then send that pass and then catch it at full speed and turn that into a face dodge. That's harder than catching it stationary up here. So those are a couple like things. If you can catch the ball and quickly turn it into a face dodge, you're going to, you're going to catch a lot of defenders off guard. Um, this is, this next one is a, is a tricky catch and shoot as well. And it's when somebody on the same side of the floor. So here is just a coach passing to a player. It's when they pass it from low to high and you have to catch it all in one motion and shoot it across your body. 
So if you could imagine if the pass came from this line here over here, like we have already practiced, this skip pass is, is a lot easier to catch and draw back into a shooting motion than this one where you have to potentially get handcuffed across your body in front of you and then still draw it back and shoot all in one motion. So that's a highly technical shooting skill. And, and where you'll see this, and last week we talked about the post-up. So imagine that this player was posting up their – maybe this balls here are, is their defender, and they're posting them up. They have the ball here. They've got them on their back. And when this guy's defender sees it, he's going to creep down and show help here, right? So to discourage this guy from trying to make a run over top of this defender. And when that happens, and it happens all the time in the NLL, this guy will dump it back up here. And I'm going to say 50% of players in the NLL usually can't pull that shot off super quickly. Johnny Palace used to be amazing at this back in the day where he would catch and shoot this into the far side top corner all in one motion. And it's literally like there's nothing you can do to defend it if he hits it because you, you're, you're supposed to show help. You're supposed to help your teammates. Problem is, if you go even one step too far and they get this back, boom, it's a quality shot almost every time. So that's what this drill is, is, uh, is practicing, is catching an adjacent pass and turning it into a shot. And then to make it even more complex, you can make it so one rep, that's what you do. You, you catch the pass and shoot. And the next rep, the person who passed to you, you, you fake a shot and work on this dump pass down here, which is usually what happens off of like a pick and roll or whatever. And then this person walks across the net practicing their faking and their finishing. And when you do that, it's all about where you start your fakes. If I started faking right when I caught it here, I'm not fooling anyone. I need to start that fake at 45 degrees off the post, which is what we talked about when we were on the floor. Um, here's the post-up drill offensively. I showed you guys last week uh, that, okay? It could be on ball or off ball. What else do I got for you here is just a couple is, is quick sticks. So usually my quick stick progressions is this. I throw you in groups of fours, okay? The three guys have balls. If they pass you a ball, you quick stick it back. You turn to the next guy, he passes to you, you quick stick it back. Um, the advanced version is there's only two guys with the ball and one guy without a ball. And what you do is one person passes it to you. And sorry, this guy here passes it to you. And then you pass it to the open player. And then the next guy passes it to you. And then you pass it to the open player. And so you're always doing it that way. And then after you get a hand for the quick sticks which is a quick in and out you don't really catch it and hold it at all then you start working on your quick stick shooting so here we've got a shooter passing to the crease and this person's playing the l which is five meters back and five meters up from the crease they're finding a soft spot and passing for a quick stick now noah this is where you have to practice as a goalie and not cheat bad goalies here they know this is coming so they don't play this guy honestly and so i'll tell this guy to take a shot every now and then just to keep the goalie honest so the goalie can practice getting back to this post yeah. and, and that's a good one for the goalie okay here you can see it on the high pass um here is this guy's cutting through the middle catching a pass while running at significant speed Okay, up here they were standing still more or less. Here they're running with speed, cutting and catching a pass. And if you really want to make this even more difficult, okay, you can add defense. You can add dummy defenders here. And so it forces A, this pass to get through a stick right here. I could also throw a defender on this guy, kind of window washing, which change, it makes this guy have to change up his angles. This isn't always going to be an overhand pass. Sometimes you're going to have to make that sidearm or an underhand pass to get it through here because there is a stick in the lane on an overhand pass, but maybe not on an underhand pass. Also, if I'm acting like I'm a threat before I send this, the goalie's going to play me. Um, if I'm looking at him and I pass over here, it's different than if I look over here for a second and then pass and the goalie knows it's coming. 
because the goalie's often reading your eyes. So that's where a no look scenario comes in. And if you can make a no look pass, it's going to make it. And I, it's something you need to practice with your wall ball and everything else. But it's, uh, it's a unique skill. And it just eventually you don't need to see because you can just trust your motor mechanics and all the time you've put in. Okay. Here we have a drill on keeping it hot. And we, we put four defenders in. The first four guys in line are all in. And all I expect them to do without being a threat is just move the ball around as fast as possible. And literally, and, and they're just, so this guy comes and receives it, runs up a little bit, passes, moving around, moving around. And we do that clockwise and counterclockwise. So we cycle it. We get nice short passes through B. Right? This is B. This is A. This is C. So this corner is, these are our ABCs. So we want to be getting the ball to the corners and then cycling it through B. Some people call this X or the point. And, and having a nice, short, safe pass here. And same thing behind the net if we were ever to reverse it behind the net. But that's one drill. And then the next... Um, variation is to add the being a threat piece so okay um i catch this i don't just immediately pass it to this guy i take a few steps to the middle being a threat and then i pass it i drag a couple steps looking at the goalie to shoot and then i dump it i walk across the crease as if i'm going to go to the net but then i curl out and i pass it so it's kind of um working on being a threat, keeping the ball hot, which is all important in terms of our offense. And so when you do that, in the end, and I got this next drill from Callum Crawford there. I think he's up for MVP this year at like age 36, the ageless wonder. But um, this is a drill. He, and this, these are patterns that you can get used to. And it's like, okay, um, you – Let's just imagine we caught the ball here, but you're starting with the ball. You attack. You try to get underneath. It's not there. You curl out. You dump it back up to the next guy. That's just all that's happening here in this drill is just attack, curl out, kick it back up. And, it, and both sides are cycling right now. Goalie's just taking some shots in the middle. Eventually connect both sides. So we go um, attack, curl out. Sorry, attack, shot, pick up a loose ball, curl out, pass back up. And that's what we're doing here is we've added a shot now to it. So it's not a curl out. It's a shot runner on a 45-degree angle where essentially you caught uh, an offensive loose ball and you had the discipline to pull it out, which is what you should do probably 90% of the time and use another 30 seconds. Um, the next variation of this is – you can add the swing passes in here and the skip passes. So with one, uh, two balls going at the same time, working at once, um, this player attacks, um, curls out to the mid boards, sends a skip pass. Um, this guy catches it here, drags back underneath, attacks, cuts in, curls out at the mid board, skip pass. So we've got cycling, skip passing happening. And this kind of, these are, if you think about it, these are like, on offense, we call this the L at the shooter. And shooters who don't cut the middle and they park, they just sit here and they play this L. And they streak up and they look, yeah, I'm open here, didn't get it. And they go down a bit to the soft spot over here, don't get it, and they just go back and forth. But outside of that, you want to be cutting in towards the middle. I should probably even have these cones even maybe a little bit more towards the middle. But it's just – it's showing that you didn't get there. So you curl out and you, you go to the midboards, which is a nice way to stretch out the defense. So, I mean, without getting into the team offense too much, um, I've covered a lot here on different advanced offensive things, more so from an individual level. We're kind of working in twos. We've got a little bit of both sides working here eventually. But um, outside of the pick and roll, these are kind of the patterns that you can be getting used to uh, working with the ball. All right?
Um, so I'm going to finish now. I just got a couple other multiple choice questions from the quiz the other day that some of us got wrong and I think is worth answering. So cue up your chats. We'll just, uh, we'll answer these questions quickly. And if I have to, I'll draw a few things up on the drill creator, but with over 50 seconds to go, um, on a, on a shot clock, offensive players should what? A, wait until all of their teammates enter the offensive zone before they engage. B, crash through the middle before filling uh, an open position in the offensive zone. C, take a shot if it's there. Uh, or D, all of the above. Or E, A and B only. So I'm seeing E, D, D and E, D and E. So a um, couple E's. Mostly E's. Okay, so E is the correct answer. Just be, as I mentioned earlier, just because I see a shot that I like with 15 seconds or 20 seconds on the clock, it's undisciplined unless it's wide open in the middle. So we want people to – we want everybody to get in the zone first and foremost. At 20 seconds, there's no guarantee that all five of our offensive players are even there. So we don't want to attack three on five. We want all of our five guys involved, all right? And, and, and even if they are, just one pass and a shot is no good. So that's why this question is important. And, I, and some uh, uh, four or five of us did choose D on the quiz, and they said they would take that shot if it's there. But guess what? Your teammates are going to get pissed if you keep doing that because if they said that too, Nobody would ever pass the ball, and everybody would just go in and try to line up their shot, and it's, it's no fun for anyone. Um, when running into the offensive zone at the start of a shift, under should run to the crease, run behind the net, cut through the middle and fill an open floor position, or run to an open floor position. C, got an answer. C. C, C, C. Good. So C, C is correct. Um, some of us won't run behind the net. I mean, there's not as much value in doing that in your league, especially on the three-man side. Okay, on the two-man side, definitely not, unless you're trying to create an ISO, a one-on-one -on -one situation. But for the most part, not. Um, but in the NLL, we can dunk, we can crease dive, we can do all these things. So uh, they do go behind the net a little bit more, which kind of I think maybe is why people think that going behind the net is, is good. It can be useful against some specific defensive systems, i.e. the pressure defense, but that's super advanced. And at the end of the day, we don't just run to the first open spot we see. We want to impose ourselves on these defenders. They're out there beating you up with sticks all game. If you're playing offense, defense, which none of you are, um, you know, it's nice to sometimes get to dish a little bit out on these D guys who are beating you up all game. But either way, it's, it's nice to do that, to let them know you've got a tough physical offense and it's going to be a long night for them and they're going to have to work hard to keep you out of the middle. And so on the start of the shift, you crash through. And part of doing that opens up the late trailers coming off the bench, which we talked about in our fast breaks as well. If I just run to a spot, um, you know, the guy who may, may have had to engage with me and cover me is now able to um, catch that trailer coming off the bench and we don't get that opportunity. So that's smart lacrosse. That's advanced offense as well. Um, when attempting a swing pass to the other side of the offense, players should. I mean, I've been hammering this home all, all day here, so um, you should know that the answer is all of the above here. Either send a pass from the point position receive it from the point position. And of course we're going to cut after, after that happens. I kind of just want to just draw that up real quickly because it's an easy visual here. But if I give you two guys, we either want a righty receiving this pass here from a lefty who let's say try to pick and roll. It didn't work. Try to screen, uh, try to run hard off the mid boards, try to go one-on-one. -on -one. Whatever it was, didn't work, okay? So um, now they're kind of in trouble. Maybe a D guy is like all over them right here, and they're really in a bad spot. 
And if that's the case, everybody should always have somebody to pass to. And that's this guy's job. And so he would even maybe have to run there to help this guy to create a passing lane so he doesn't have to throw this through a stick. But we want these to be nice, safe passes across the top because they're, they're the most picked off passes in lacrosse. So either this guy ran, ran there to receive it or uh, just move them. This guy runs to the point to, dish, to, to swing it. Okay, Maybe this guy's even up here around the shooter, but we still want this shorter pass because the worst thing you could do is this. See the difference? That's through two defenders, potentially. It's uh, probably 50% longer of a pass. Uh, more likely to get picked off, more likely to get dropped. And so we always want somebody here for the pass. Uh, when a teammate on, the proper, on their proper floor side cuts the middle, a teammate on the same side should. Pass to the cutter if they're open. Phil replace the spot vacated by the cutter. Follow the cutter, all of the above, or answer A and B. Go ahead and respond in the chat. E and D. You guys know I like to do this with my questions. D, D, D. It's actually E. You do want to pass to the cutter if they're open, of course. Fill and replace the spot left by the cutter. But you don't want to follow them, too. We don't need two guys on top of each other in the middle. Because, really, that's just clogging up the middle. Why would, if, if this guy cut, why would I just, why would I cut? right after him, right on top of him, and we're both in the middle. It's a bit of a trick question, but we, we want to stay clear of the middle. If you're going to the middle, go with a purpose. Go hard. Like It's going to take some effort to get past the defenders to get inside out, which we want to do on our picks. But um, once you get in there, if you don't get it, get out. Don't stay in there because you're getting in somebody else's way. Uh, a couple other questions. After passing to a teammate on offense, your next course of action should be run behind the net. Well, we just discussed that. So no, cut towards the net. That's your answer. Okay, we don't need you standing around waiting. And you don't need to necessarily fill the position you pass to. Not necessarily. Sometimes, yes. But always cut the middle after you pass. Whether it's for a pick, just a straight cut, just keeps things moving and helps create a, a flow on offense. The object, this, is a, this is the one I was talking about, which I think is crucial. It's kind of a team offense thing, but the objective of most offensive sets before taking a shot should be to swing the ball back and forth between the shooters, pass the ball low and set a down pick, make a couple passes and engage in the two-man game, or pass the ball low, carry it high, and swing it through the point at least twice. What do you guys think? D, pass the ball low, carry it high, swing through at least twice. So that's buying into a team concept. Okay, just passing it low, setting one pick, and going. That's, that's what I just talked about with our development group. Right? We already know it's going to take multiple picks to get somebody open. So why not get them all clustered and confused with who they have, head turning, uh, you know, loot, ball watching, watching, not watching their defender, maybe somebody. And by the way, if somebody does become wide open in these basic passes, then great. But we're doing this with a point of not forcing anything. We're just getting it low, carrying it high, and swinging it. And just buying into that and trying not to turn, turn it over while you do that. And if you do that, then, then when you set a pick, it's going to work. Then when you go one-on-one, -on -one, it's going to work. But if you just go one-on-one -on -one off of one pass, it's not going to work. Okay? Not, not the level that we're going to. So, um, lastly, after a shot, the shooter should, A, attack the rebound with the opposite side, low offender reacting back. The shooter, the shooter reacting back with the same side, low offender attacking the rebound. The off-ball high, def 
offender is ultimately responsible as a general rule, or D, the shooter should react back and the opposite side, low offender, should attack the rebound if it's there. What do you guys think? D, a couple Ds. Okay. The shooter should react back. Well, what if the, what if the shooter shoots and the ball um, comes out on the short side and they and it's a 50 50 ball for them would, would would they attack it or would they react back you can answer that one verbally if you want we're about to wrap up here attack okay attack attack if it's a 50 50 ball right so if you come to the bench and you lose that ball and you say you know what i thought it was a 50 50 ball and you lost it, it turned out to be a 40-60, I'm okay with that. At least you're thinking the game the right way. But the actual golden rule, okay, obviously um, if the shooter's on the far side away from the bench, they're going to need to be on their horse getting back too. But the golden rule is that the off-ball high player, the, the non-shooter in the shooter position on the off-ball side, it's their responsibility, which a lot, unless if the ball goes to the far side and they get a 50, 50 ball, that's where the shooter reacting back would make sense. But generally speaking, it's the off ball high guy unless the shooter attacks the rebound or somebody attacks the rebound. Cause if the, if it hits the goalie, guess what? Both of you are reacting back. And the reason I'm bringing it up is because probably right now nobody's reacting back. So as a coach, I'm always stressing it in my drills. And that's good offense. A good offensive habit is after you shoot, what's next? Well, don't give up a fast break. And that goes for everybody. Get hard off the floor and, and play your role, okay, which was, was, a, was a big theme here today in talking advanced offense. So hopefully you guys learned something. I know I did most of the talking today. Um, I'm going to try to think of some ways to engage you a little bit more moving forward in some discussions, but we're going to, we're going to talk a little bit of uh, team transition next session um, as, as well as a few other um, little items of note that I'll bring up. So uh, that's what you can expect, but thanks for your tuning in here today and uh, um, we will see you in a few days. Thank you, chat. Thanks, yeah. chat. Thanks, chat.